Welcome to the Psychedelic Passage Podcast. My name is Nick Levich, and I'm here with Jimmy Wynn. Thanks for joining us today. This week, we are talking all about the difference between how folks feel immediately after the journey and then the potential long-term benefits that can be realized from going through a medium to high dose psychedelic ceremony. And I've personally felt really called to address this topic because um, lately, especially, we've had a number of clients who um, go through the journey, they go through a ceremony, and either during the ceremony itself or immediately after, they end up in this inquisitive, questioning, almost judgment style mode where it's like, am I feeling better? Did it work? Uh, is this is this what I can expect? Or, oh, I feel worse now. And so there's this, there's this disconnect between how folks are feeling during the journey and in that immediate, call it 48 hours to one week, and then how they can feel long term afterwards. And, and so part of what's happening here from my perspective is that when we look at the, the literature that's coming out of Johns Hopkins and some of these researched in institutions, what's made very clear is that they're waiting to make their determination on efficacy until three to six months of integration with the therapist have taken place. And so it's a little bit unfair to compare how you feel coming fresh out of a journey to how someone may feel after three to six months of integration. And so I'm curious, you know, Jim, is this something that you've seen too with your clients? Oh, all the time, all, all the time. Well, what comes up for me is that, well, first and foremost, I, I hear you talking a little bit about timeline. I also hear you talking a little bit about expectations as yep. well. Yep. And and the main thing that I try to uh, express to people who are psychedelic curious or, or people who are just on a pursuit of healing anyways, is this reminder that it's not a linear step up process, like, like, like any process where you are trying to resolve something or heal a wound or learn more about yourself or whatnot. It's not this linear gradient that you just follow along this path. And so the word dynamic comes up for me and really trying to express to folks that, hey, it might actually feel more exacerbated for a time. Let's say for in the example where the psychedelic medicine shines a light on all of your issues and all of your right. shadow stuff and brings it up up to the present. And you know, when I think about the difference between that being a process of suffering versus a, a potentially constructive process is how much support do you have around you with that? And your willingness to go there. So one of the other things that I see is is a lot of us are conditioned to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Mm -hmm. But part of the healing work inherently involves discomfort. There's just no way around it. And so part of it comes down to the journeyer's willingness to sit in that discomfort. It's always temporary, but it's a pretty essential part of the healing process. Mm -hmm. And so one of the analogies that I use a lot is like, a lot of us are emotionally constipated. We have these emotions <laughs> that have been that have been buried in our in our yeah. system, right? And so the analogy for me is like, okay, well, these ceremonies are like pouring Drano down the pipe, and a lot of that emotion gets moved in the journey itself, but it continues to move afterwards. Some Often of it gets dissolved. Some of it gets. Uh, a pass through some of it stays stuck there. Sure, exactly. And uh -huh. so, and so you can't expect that all that's going to get cleared out in the you know four to six hours you're journeying. It keeps moving afterwards. And so you know, let's say you've been deeply depressed your whole life, and you go through a journey. And I've seen this happen where people feel more depressed after, especially if they've tapered off their SSRIs because the SSRIs were masking those emotions. And mm -hmm. now the full force of 20, 30, 40 years of depression is coming flowing through and it's not comfortable, but it will pass. And, and so the challenge here is like, you know, 
from my perspective, there's a disconnect between how mainstream media is portraying these medicines and then what it actually looks like on the ground to heal. Yeah, it's, it's um, a little bit of a of a double edged sword when you hear folks say, oh, one session equals 10 years of therapy. It can. It can. <laughs> However, it's not always the case. And and in, in that regard, I think it's important for people to recognize that a lot of this is also our how we view healing in our society. And this is changing over time as well, but we are in somewhat of a resolve the symptoms and maybe you'll feel better. And to your point, what we do is we mask a lot of things throughout our lives. And I always tell you know, clients, A, first and foremost, there's no replacement of anything external that will um, take over the process of this internal thing that you need to go through to release that thing or to yeah. come into perspective and understanding about, you know, whatever that is that, that you're struggling with. And that also it is a, like I keep going back to, a, a dynamic process. And so it's, 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 it's a hard expectation when folks are, especially folks who I find who are uh, very desperate. Yeah, the states of despair make this so much harder. Yeah, because it just sets up a real tall order. It sets up a real high expectation for folks to say, well, all these other people in these in these studies and reports got this benefit, and then I'm not feeling that. Does that mean that I'm broken? Does that mean that it's not working for me? And it's not always the case that you have a psychedelic experience and you immediately feel relief. You know, you talk about in previous episodes about uh, any particular psychedelic medicine, but the medicine gives you what you need and not what you want. And, and one thing that really rings through clearly for me is that the lessons need to come in a way that gets your attention. Yeah. In times. And sometimes to get your attention, it's got to rock you a little bit. Yep. yep. I had a gentleman who um, was shown very clearly what's going to happen if he continues on the path that he's going to be on. And it was dark and it was scary and he was going to lose his family and there was going to be all these repercussions that are super serious. Mm. And it was a challenging journey to go through, but it was a very real reminder for him of, you know, what's going to happen if he doesn't change his behaviors. So to your point, not necessarily easy or comfortable or fun, but there was a very important lesson baked in there. And it was likely one of the only ways he was going to get that was seeing it to that magnitude, that extreme. Mm. Yeah, I'm reminded of another client who described the first half of their psilocybin experience as he was like, this is great. This is rainbows and butterfly. The music's great. You're doing great. I'm doing great. I'm feeling great. And then at about halfway through, um, they started to uh, open up about some things that they had been carrying for a while. Yep. And then what happened was their mechanisms started to kick in. Their mechanisms of the uh, uncomfortableness, the mechanism of coming to grips with that truth. And immediately after the experience, they had reported, you know, if it was all rainbow and butterflies this whole time, I wouldn't have gotten it. Like yeah. I needed to actually go through some of the suffering to actually recognize how much suffering I've been putting on myself in my own life. And it's not always self-inflicted, by the way, but it is a, an important concept of this. And, and the other part, too, when you think about or when you're talking about timeline is that the integration process inherently dis is about taking this peak experience and folding it into your life. Well, in order for that to happen, you got to go through a little bit of life to, yeah. to have some post experience life events that maybe put some things into place for you or, or connect some dots for you as well. And you got to give that time. You gotta so I want to I want to touch on this as well, because this is something that I have to share all the time is if the work that we're doing here is largely subconscious and nervous system oriented. When you leave the journey, cognitively, you may not know what shifted. 
Mm-hmm. And so the only way to start to to realize what shifted is to start to engage with life, which is exactly what mm-hmm. you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so what I tell folks is like, notice what happens when you start to engage with life again. Mm. You may notice that you're not triggered by something that you used to. You may notice that you don't want to eat unhealthy food anymore. You may notice that this friend group that you were used to getting together with is actually not anything you're interested in participating in. Mm. Um, and so the life essentially reflects back at us these subtle subconscious and nervous system changes and but but what happens is we exist in a culture of rationalization and mental thought and so if if we can't pinpoint like hey what shifted then we then we convince ourselves that it didn't work mm, let me add something to your list uh, you also may notice that there are certain patterns, habits, thought processes, and emotional things that persist after the experience. And then you notice that, wow, those things are really strong and have a grip on my life. And that actually might be a signal that you need to work through that more right. also. So so the other side of, of, of this not just alleviating the symptomatic part, it's also highlighting what continued work you you need to do for sure and so it it it, it, it's it's both of those things yeah and so you know one of the things that i think would be helpful for folks is is okay how do we work through some of this Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for starters this is an emotionally heavy process and so i like (laughs) yeah you have to be willing to sit in discomfort, not forever, not for eternity, but for most folks, this stirs the pot. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a snow globe that's representative of our, our internal state of being, and these journeys shake that whole thing up. Mm-hmm. And it takes a while for that dust to settle and things get rearranged, and um, it can be a very messy, uncomfortable process and that's not talked about very often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I want to add that for many folks who are seeking change, it's important to recognize that there's a part of their being that also wants to stay the same. By nature of us as humans, we are habit-forming creatures who try to predict safety and stability and therefore like things being in in the status quo even for people who are deeply deeply suffering like there's a part of us that gets somewhat addicted to to that suffering and so in the pursuit of of change it's always very important for folks to acknowledge and recognize what parts of them are resisting because if they allow that part of them to go back to status quo i'll say and if we're not aware of that, that there is that mechanism in there of survival, right? Then it then becomes really difficult when that individual is feeling like, oh, I'm regressing or, oh, maybe I did feel this thing for a very fleeting moment in my psychedelic experience, but then now I'm kind of back to my own, you know, normal thing. And and so that must mean that the medicine's not working. That must mean that I'm broken. That must mean that I'm I'm ineligible for, they close the door at any type of healing. And I really challenge folks with that, my clients at least. I challenge them to think, well, maybe there's this part of you that there's this self-preservation part that does want you, maybe on an unconscious or subconscious level, to keep things the same because it's gotten you this far through 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. But then I share with people, but look at the cost of that. You know, look at the cost of what that's done, you know, to your life and just remembering something that you say very often is the cost of change greater than the cost of staying the same. Which one actually creates and causes, you know, more pain? And I'll share with folks that this is courageous shit. Like this is this is an act of courage to go through some suffering during a psychedelic experience or afterwards or feel this uh, amazing benefit from a psychedelic experience only to have that somewhat wash away, it then is very courageous to continue on a path of unfolding, 
continue yeah. on a path of, of, of processing like and like, the clients I, yeah. the clients that are willing to walk that path it always comes around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's it's the people that throw in the towel two weeks after because it's too uncomfortable that are that there's no hope there's no chance like you you have basically given up on yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i, I the, this discussion i think is just really important because um no research talks about this no studies are talking about this dynamic and so everyone ev everyone's all hyped up on psychedelics right now and <laughs> and nobody's talking about the the very real ways in which this process actually works and that's part of the reason that we created this whole show to begin with I know you meant hyped up as in like interested in psychedelics. I was thinking people just like walking around tripping, tripping all day, every day. Uh, that's not that's not what we mean about no. hyped up on on psychedelics. Yeah, <laughs> but it's. I mean, this is the emerging therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, by all accounts, this is like the newest tool um, in the therapy toolkit for decades. And we have to remember that. A, one, one of the things that we have a little bit of a disadvantage on is that when you look at the history of psychedelic use in human culture, it's often very much integrated into family systems, community, community systems. You know, children are raised with the awareness that these are medicines. And we don't necessarily have that in our society. At all. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> We're, we're hoping that <laughs> through real meaningful dialogue and conversation that there is an opportunity to integrate these things into there. But a, a principle that you find across, I'm going to guess to say every culture that, that uses some type of medicinal sacrament for healing, the challenging and overwhelming and, dis and uncomfortable experiences are not only an integral part of this type of healing, but it's welcomed. And so to your point, that resistance to um, that, that continued pain of healing, I think that that can be a real uh, disservice, I think, to people who are looking for long lasting healing. And, and I'm talking about in a way where you don't even have to go back to a psychedelic experience if you don't want to. Like in a way where your healing is so long term and so ingrained into your being that you don't need to chase down a peak experience to um, really feel like like you've gotten to a place where you're where you're healed. And so I share with folks, uh, you know what my favorite clients are? They're the ones who are like, well, I've suffered so much already that it doesn't matter how uncomfortable this is because I've already gone to hell and back. Right. And so let's do it. You know, let, let, let's go for it. I'm like, that's actually a real that uh, into this. Or the folks who a bit of a nuance, but I think I've said this in a past episode, really ready to like go to war with themselves or just really, really embracing, you know, a, a challenging and difficult. They just know it's going to be uncomfortable. And then I would say that a lot of those folks actually get surprised with very smooth and you know, blissful and like joyful experiences because they went there in preparation. They already yeah. went there and they already tried to uncover and they're like, ah, there's all this stuff that could potentially be here and I'm here for it and I'm ready for it and I'm ready for it after the psychedelic experience as well. Yeah, it's the willingness to go there that makes all the difference. And if there's one thing that I hope folks take from this episode is that it's a messy, nonlinear process. But mm -hmm. if you're willing to stick with it, it does provide these immense long term lasting benefits. You got to be willing to do the work, though. And everyone always is like, well, what's the work? And it's it's about taking ownership of your situation and recognizing that no part of this is a quick fix. Mm -hmm. Most of us are up against decades of, of social conditioning and and frankly, the older you are, the more you have to work through. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and we can't expect to change our entire behaviors, especially the toxic habits and patterns, literally overnight. This may help move the needle, but to your point, it has to be integrated into your day-to-day -day life, and that takes work. And so, 
you know, the other the other phenomenon that we see quite frequently is folks who leave the journey and they may approach integration earnestly for a week and then they just kind of stop with all daily practices, all time spent dedicated towards integration. And that also just isn't going to work. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I also want to bring up that there is this emphasis on one experience, one ceremony, one session, one treatment. It sets up a little bit of a false narrative when we, uh, you know, read these studies or, you know, watch um, these doc documentaries. So necessary and needed, by the way. Thank you to all the researchers and documentarians and all those folks, you know, doing that. However, in our society, it sets it up as, well, let me go through this one ceremony and let's see if I get healed. And we see this all the time also with ketamine assisted psychotherapy and things like that. But the emphasis is that for some folks, it may just be one. For some folks, it may be one with a lot of integration. For some folks, it may be one with a lot of integration with a mental health professional. For some folks, they need to actually come back to successive ceremonies because there is this uh, like you say peeling back of the layers and so maybe your first experience that is challenging uncomfortable difficult regardless of the content of your experience let's say your integration you feel like you are losing that luster or let's say you are confronting some of your some of your shit Oftentimes, it's going through that, which then maybe might prime you for a second experience where you've done a lot of that work. And you're like, OK, now I can build on top of that. And now I can go in a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. Like the first one was really challenging my defense mechanisms. Now that I've gone through that and that I can see that I've come out of that experience and that I'm, I'm back to default reality. Well, that's kind of how life is. It all stacks on top of each other. You know, the perspective that we have now is built upon all of the past life experiences that we've had. And so the psychedelic healing process is the same. It's, 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 it's the same. And you then have to, I, I think if people would broaden their perspective on how healing with psychedelics goes about. We like to put things in a box and like define things, right? We're like, well, if I'm not feeling results after two weeks of a psychedelic ceremony, then I must be doing something wrong or it didn't uh, work. It didn't work. Or maybe it's my uh, maybe uh, my physiology has, you know, ruled me out from this. And if you believe that, guess what? That's going to be true. But if you believe that there is this possibility that sometimes in the pursuit of healing, it's really, really painful before it starts to get better, then that just opens you up to more possibility of your own healing, but also more possibility of support. Yeah. So there's two things that you touched on really clearly here that are the pitfalls. One is expectations uh -huh. and two is judgment. Mm -hmm. The yep. more of those two things that we have, the harder this whole process is going to be. Mm hmm. And, and the clients that tend to have the toughest time are the ones that are judging it at every step of the way. Is this working? Did it help? Did it work? Am I fixed? Th that is just unhealthy lines of questioning. Mm -hmm. It's let really me add, not yeah. helpful. Yeah, I'll just add also that when expectations and judgment comes into play, the only person you have to get real with about those things is yourself. And I've had so many folks who, you know, just want to say the right things to, to move through the screening process. They're like, I totally know this isn't a magic bullet or a cure. I know you've had a couple of these. Oh, yeah. I, I don't have any expectations on how this should look. I'm open to all possibilities. I know this isn't a cure all. And then they're in the midst of their experience and they're going through something cha uh, challenging. They're like, I guess I do have expectations and I do want this to be a certain way and I am expecting healing and all that. And that's a hard process to go through in the middle of a psychedelic experience. And it happens regularly. Regularly. And so I share with folks, you got to get right with yourself on where you're at. Because if you just say the stuff 
and in the back of your mind or in your heart, you are really expecting this external thing to come in and do the stuff for you, it's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's really not going to happen. So I think the expectations and when we're talking about expectations, it's okay to have expect it's it's okay to have expectations. But where we draw the line is the expectation on how it should look, when it should be, the timeline. The timeline it, that sets up a real hard fall if it do, if none of that matches up to it. And also judgment to a degree is okay. You have to use your discernment and judgment to pick the right facilitator. But what we're talking about is the judgment of your process. Outcomes. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the solution here is to have grace, patience, curiosity, openness, persistence. That's what's needed in integration after the journey to actually hold all this. I've had clients who have incredibly challenging re-entries afterwards, but they'll stick with it. Mm -hmm. And five, six weeks later, we have a check-in and look at that. They're making real progress. But up until that point, messy, challenging, uh, uh, confusing, uncomfortable. And so this goes back to the nonlinear nature of this work. All of this stuff takes time. And it's the folks who are willing to stick with it that really get the real results. Yeah, and that I think is universal regardless of how experienced you are. If you're new to psychedelics, if you're, um, if you got hundreds of experiences under your, I mean, this is happening to me right now. I shared with you, I had an experience on Saturday that just like blew my whole thing open in the most beautiful way possible. And for the, for the couple of days afterwards, I was in a real flow state and and really feeling whole. And this morning, I woke up with shame and guilt. I woke up with that and I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm feeling it. <laughs> so <laughs> so my, my own thing, right, I'm, I'm talking this through and and, and I, I felt this analytical part of my mind coming in. I was like, oh, where, let's locate this and let's eradicate this, like where is this coming from? And I really just sat with it for a while. And And another thing, I really felt it. I allowed myself to really feel the shit. And in that feeling, I was able to embrace it a little bit more. And it was just such a reminder as, as I woke up today with, with shame and guilt, I, I, I like was trying to like solve it, right? But then in this part, I just kind of sat with it and I was like, what does this have to show me? What does this have to show me? Because sometimes it needs to be front and center in your face to show you whatever it is that, that you need to, to learn. It's like some of our favorite uh, teachers and mentors. Think, think, I'm sure every person has some figure in their life who they probably looked up to. And maybe those figures weren't super kind to you all the time. Maybe they were just telling you how it is sometimes, you know? Maybe they were just giving you that like hard truth sometimes in order for you to really hear it. And so even for me, who had been through hundreds of experiences, held space for a lot of different folks, I, I'm, I was going through it. And, and so what I want to share with folks is that it's okay. It's okay to go through that. But yeah. it's important that you name it. And it's important that you acknowledge it. It's important that you get help and support around it as well. I mean, one of the things that you're highlighting very clearly is that um, emotions are central to this process. And we as a Western culture are not very well equipped to hold our emotions. Mm -hmm. And where things go south for most people is we experience one of these uncomfortable emotions like shame or guilt, which isn't usually the problem. The problem comes in when we assign a story to it. Yes. Yes. And so... It goes from just feeling the shame and guilt in your body to then, oh, I'm a bad person. I did all these things. I'm broken. And that story is actually what keeps the emotion mm -hmm. looping through your system. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps that stuff ricocheting through your body and your mind. Yeah, Right. And so uh -huh. if we can withhold the story, then you're just feeling the emotion in your body. And what I tell folks and myself is you can only feel the emotion for so long before it passes. Mm -hmm. It always passes. 
everything is temporary. We're constantly in this state of, of flux and transition. And so if we can just sit with it and honor it, it'll pass. There's no question about it. We can't stay stuck in an emotional state forever. The only way that can happen is if we continue to support it with the mental narrative. Self-perpetuate it. Yeah. And that's a process of days, weeks, months, years. I've grieved over the the loss of, of loved ones in my life for years. And it's come through to be one of the most important parts of my own healing. So, so ju- just just a an example of uh, of what you're sharing. Yeah. yeah. Anything else that you think would be tangible for folks to really un- understand about this? Obviously, you're hearing Nick and I very very passionate about this because it is somewhat of a, like you said something that's not discussed a lot, and I think something that that with the right perspective can help i think a lot of folks who are approaching but anything else tangibly that might be supportive for people here i have one other tool that i like this was shared with me by my mentor um and it's 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 called prescribe the symptom and so a lot of times what happens is folks are feeling depressed they're like i don't want to feel depressed they're trying to escape this feeling of depression well what happens if you just give yourself permission to be fully depressed for a little bit and so that's the whole the whole piece of prescribing the symptom is like, okay, well, the symptom is depression. Give yourself full permission to just be as depressed as you want for a week. Really feel into it. And that eliminates the judgment piece because now there's permission involved. And then once again, you're only going to feel that for so long before you're like, all right, I'm kind of sick of depression. I'm going to do something else now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, I, I share with folks two, I call them golden rules of, of integration. And they sound really simple and maybe almost borderline cliche, but the reason why I bring it up is that um, people have a much harder time doing this than it actually sounds. One is being kind and gentle to yourself through this process, which I hear you when you're talking about this lack of judgment. Like, imagine if there was a child going through some struggling issues. Well, how would you treat that child? I would hope that you'd be kind and gentle and understanding and give them a little bit of grace when they're going through it. So maybe it's helpful for you to apply that a little bit to yourself. And then the other part that's really hard to do is taking care of your needs. And those needs can be uh, physiological needs, physical needs, social needs, emotional needs, support needs, mental health needs. Like there's so many different types of needs out there because if you are going through this process and it's challenging well it's a little bit strategic to set yourself up in a prime environment in which for you to go through that the only way that that's a prime environment is if it helps and supports and takes care of of your needs and so there's so many different ways so 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 many different ways yeah what i what i find folks doing is is like you're saying like kind of uh mentally and emotionally throwing in the towel and then that closes the door on, on any other type of support that that might be helpful for you. So. Yeah, I really like those. Thanks for sharing. Um, and so just a reminder to all who are listening, if you feel funky after, if you feel worse after, if you don't know what's happening after, it's okay. It doesn't mean it didn't work to the best of your ability. Stick with the process, engage the support that you need and stick with it. I promise if you continue to stick with it for that three to six month window, real change is possible. Just know that. Um, That brings us to the end of our episode for today. Thank you all for joining us. You can download episodes of the Psychedelic Podcast and look for all of our episodes by going to CannabisRadio.com or subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever else you may stream your podcasts. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and review, and we'll see you guys next week.
the opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.